What's up guys, welcome back to another video. Today we'll be creating our very first CRUD RESTful API using Java, MySQL, Spring Boot, JPA, and Maven. Be sure to like this video and subscribe to the channel so you guys can see all of the new content I've been posting. It's much appreciated. So to actually do this tutorial, you'll need Java, Maven, and MySQL Workbench installed on your machine. I'll provide all of the links in the description box, so please check it out. And once you're done with that, you can come back here and resume the video. So once you're all set with all the things we need, Let's go ahead and start. So now let's get started. Let's start with an API. So basically an API stands for application programming interface. An API is a set of rules and mechanisms by which one application or component interacts with the others. So what exactly is a RESTful API then? REST is an architectural style. RESTful is basically the interpretation of it. So essentially the design of a REST API will look like this. You have a client, a UI for example. This UI calls an API. The API will perform operations on the database like creating data, deleting data, updating data, and reading data. So a REST API has four major operations. Receiving data in a convenient format, creating new data, updating data, and deleting data. So this is exactly where the CRUD acronym comes from. In CRUD, the C stands for create, the R stands for read, U is update, and D is delete. So how do APIs actually exchange data? JSON is something that's used to exchange data with RESTful APIs. JSON stands for JavaScript Object Notation. We can send JSON to the server to create, update, and delete data. When we read data, we can also get it in a JSON format. This is great because JSON is compatible with all programming languages, meaning that when we're using RESTful APIs, we can communicate with any application no matter what the app was actually written in. So this is awesome. REST also relies heavily on the HTTP protocol. Each REST operation uses its own HTTP method. An HTTP GET request is when you are receiving any kind of data. For example, when you simply browse to any URL, you are actually performing a GET request. This corresponds to the read-in crowd. An HTTP POST request is usually the creation of data, so submitting a form on the user interface or any other client would be considered a POST. This corresponds to the create-in crowd. An HTTP PUT request is when you're updating data, so for example, Updating the name of a user in a database would be considered a put. This corresponds with the update in the crowd. And finally, an HTTP delete request is when you're deleting data. So deleting your account from a website or say deleting a tweet from Twitter would be an example of a delete request. This corresponds to the delete in crud. Whenever you make an HTTP request, a status code gets returned. These are the five major types of status codes. 1xx would be informational. 2xx would be success, 3xx would be redirection, 4xx would be a client error, and 5xx is generally a server error. So like I said before, we'll be creating this API using Spring Boot, Maven, JPA, and MySQL. So in case you're not familiar, Spring Boot is an open source Java-based framework used to create a microservice or any kind of service. Maven is a build automation tool used primarily for Java projects. Maven can also do other things like run automated tests, package our app into a jar or war file so we can deploy it to any server, and also Maven gets all of our dependencies that we'll need like Spring Boot, JPA, etc. JPA stands for Java Persistence API. It's a collection of classes and methods to persistently store data in a database. JPA is great because it saves us from writing some boilerplate code that we usually have to write because JPA can do things like create tables for us and columns automatically. Lastly, MySQL is an open source relational database management system used to manage databases. The MySQL client I'll be using personally is MySQL Workbench. I've also included a link to this in the description if you'd like to use it as well. So now that all of the background is out of the way, let's actually get started in writing our first RESTful API. Go ahead and open any browser and browse to start.spring.io. This is a Spring Initializer. Spring Initializer generates a Spring Boot project for you without you having to do anything. So prior to actually generating a project, you'll be able to do things like add dependencies. So let's go ahead and configure our project. So at the top, keep Maven project selected, keep Java selected for the language, and for the Spring Boot version, you want to keep whatever version is selected by default. Now let's move on to the project metadata. For the group name, I'm going to type com.johnson.app. You can name this whatever you'd like. I'm using Johnson for my last name, but it's mainly up to you. For artifact, I'm just going to call it rest. Then for the name, I'm just going to say REST API. And then for the description, I'll just say sample CRUD REST API. We can leave the package name as is. We can leave the packaging as is. We'll keep it as jar. And the version of Java you need is 8, so select 8. Now we can add our dependencies. 
go ahead and search for web, add spring web, and that is all we need for now. You can go ahead and generate your project. Once it's generated, you can unzip the folder. Now, once the folder is unzipped, you can go ahead and open up your favorite IDE. We can close out of Chrome now. I'm going to go ahead and open up IntelliJ. Next, I'm going to import a project. Select import project. Now browse for that extracted folder. Next, we want to keep it as import project from external model. Select Maven, click next, click next again. We'll keep all the defaults, next, next, and then click finish. So now we have our first Spring Boot project actually generated. Let's go ahead and expand the folder. In our package, you see we have a REST API application class. Let's go ahead and open that. In here, we have a very simple class. Within the class, we have our main method. And then within that main method, we're calling one function. We're also annotating this class with the Spring Boot application annotation. So this annotation is basically telling the IDE that this is indeed a Spring Boot app. It's that simple, guys. Spring Boot makes things very easy for us. Let's go ahead and open up the pom.xml file. The pom.xml file is where Maven puts all of their dependencies. As you see, we have dependency section, and then within that, we have each dependency. So we don't need to know too much about this, guys. I'm going to be doing a Maven tutorial in the future, so stay tuned for that. But for now, just know that this is where Maven keeps the dependencies and other metadata. Go ahead and X that out, and let's run this to see what happens. In the console, we get started REST API application in 1.472 seconds. And then above that, we can see that Tomcat has started on port 8080. Basically, Tomcat is just an app server that you can deploy applications to. So let's go ahead and open up our browser again and browse to localhost colon 8080 so as you see we get this error that says white label error page this might look like it's bad but this is actually great that means spring boot is indeed running so we're seeing this error basically because we don't have a get endpoint there's nothing to really show so this is just a default error that spring boot provides for us because we don't have a slash error mapping so let's go ahead and go back to IntelliJ and let's create our first actual endpoint I'm gonna create a new package called controller a new class called API controllers. Within that, let's create a new method called get page. Okay, so this method has a return type of string and it's called get page. Now in this method, let's just return welcome. Okay, we have a very simple method. Okay, so now let's annotate this class with the annotation called rest controller. Make sure you guys import that from the spring framework. That tells the IDE that this class is indeed a rest controller and that we're going to have some type of endpoints in here. Now let's go ahead and annotate the method with at get mapping. After that, add some parentheses and we can add a value here for the actual endpoint that we'd like. Let's go ahead and just set it to a forward slash. The forward slash is the default endpoint that gets hit when accessing an application. Like when we hit localhost 8080, by default, it hits the forward slash. So now we have a value a forward slash. Now let's go ahead and run this and see what happens. So in the console, we see that our app has started on port 8080 once again. Now let's go back to the browser and see what's different. Let's refresh this. And as you see, we see welcome. Congrats, guys. So basically, we really do have our first API created, but it's not a CRUD API just yet because we're not creating or updating or deleting anything just yet. We're just really reading and all we're reading is welcome. We're not reading from the database. We're not really doing anything fancy. All we're doing is returning welcome. But as you see, guys, it is indeed working so far. Now let's go back to IntelliJ. Let's create a new package called models. So within that new package, right click and create a class called user. So moving forward, this user object is what we'll be creating, reading, deleting and updating. So now let's go ahead and add some attributes to this user class. OK, so now we have our attributes created. So user will have an ID, a first name, a last name, an age and an occupation. So this ID attribute is actually going to act as a primary key in the database. All right, now let's generate some getters and setters. OK, great. Now we have all of our getters and setters generated. OK, guys, now let's go ahead and go to our POM and add the dependencies for JPA in MySQL. OK, guys, as you see, we have our two new dependencies. We have a dependency for JPA and a dependency for MySQL. Great. OK, now let's go back to our user class and add some annotations to it. We have an entity annotation at the top that tells MySQL that this user class will indeed be a table within the database. So for the ID attribute, we have ID and generated value annotated. This tells MySQL that ID will be unique for each user. Next, we have column annotated for each value. That tells MySQL that each one of those attributes will be a column in the database. So now let's go back and create another package called repo. Next, you want to create a new interface within that package. Right click, go to new, select class, and then in the drop down, change it to interface. Call this interface user repo. Next, within that repo, we want to extend the JPA repository. Next, we want to pass in the brackets, a user and a long. Awesome. And that's all we need to do to this class. Now, let's go ahead and open up the resources folder and browse to your applications.properties file. So the application.properties file is the file that Spring looks for when doing configurations or setting various properties. So we can even set things like the port that we want to deploy to whenever we run this application. So we can set something like server.port equals 9000. Let's go ahead and try that. So if I were to run this application, instead of deploying to 
localhost 8080 when we run, it would actually use port 9000. So this is an example of something that we can do within a properties file. So let's go ahead and delete this because we actually don't want that. Now I'm going to add some properties for our database connection. Okay, so now I have the database properties. First, we have a URL for our database. The name of the schema that we'll be using is CRUD users. We'll create that after this. And then I'm using the default root username as well as my password. When you first installed MySQL Workbench, you should have created a root username as well with a password. So just use yours. Okay, so now you want to save that and open up MySQL Workbench. So within MySQL Workbench, you want to click the plus next to MySQL Connections and create your first connection. Let's name this RESTful API. As you see in the username, we have root, and then we're going to use our password. So now let's hit test connection at the bottom and enter your password. Awesome. It says successfully made the MySQL connection. Great. That's exactly what we wanted. So now click OK and then click OK and get out of here. Now you want to open up that connection that we just created, RESTful API. Now on this left hand side in the schema section, you want to right click and click create schema. Now we're going to name this schema exactly what we named it here, CRUD users. Click apply, click apply again. Now we're all set. We have CRUD users created. Awesome. Now let's go ahead and go back to IntelliJ. Let's run our application. Awesome. Everything worked as expected. So now we have the project started up on port 8080 once again. Now let's actually go back to MySQL Workbench. Expand the CRUD users schema. And as you see, we have a users table generated. If you don't see a users table, try right clicking on the CRUD user schema and refreshing. Let's right click on users and just do select rows. As you see, we have an ID, age, first name, last name, and occupation column. These are all of the properties from our model. As you see, we never had to create the table by hand or the columns itself. This is awesome. This saves us so much time. So now let's actually persist some of these users. Let's actually save some users to the database, get some users from the database, update some users and delete them. So now let's go back to our controller package and open up API controller. So now what we want to do is inject our repository. Now you want to annotate that declaration with AutoWire. Basically, the AutoWire annotation handles all dependency injection for us. Now let's create a new method. So now we have a new method called get users of type void. So what's great about the JPA database is it comes with a whole bunch of pre-built methods. Some of the methods are things like getting a list of your object from the database, getting an individual object from the database, updating an object in the database, deleting an object in the database, and so on. So let's go ahead and return one of those methods in our get users function. So we're going to return this user repo dot find all. What this will do is return all of our users from the database. So let's change our return type to actually be a list of users. Import that list. Now next, we need to annotate our method with get mapping. Let's give it a value of users. Let's save this and run it and see what happens. OK, so as you see, when we browse to localhost 8080, we still get welcome. Now let's forward slash and go to users. As you see, we get an empty array. This is because we don't have any users in the database but we actually see that this endpoint is indeed working. Great. So now go back to the code. Now let's actually create a function for saving a user. Now we'll utilize another one of the repo functions. This function will take in an object of type user. Next, we want to annotate this method with post mapping because this is a post method. Remember, whenever we're saving something to the database, it'll be a post. Let's give it a value of save. Next, we need to annotate our user parameter with at request body because this is what will get sent through the request using JSON. We're going to send a user through JSON. Next, we need to annotate our user parameter with at request body because what will get sent through the request in the body is an actual user object. The user object will be written in JSON. Since we don't have a user interface to actually submit this user to save, we're going to have to use another client. There's a whole bunch of other clients you can use or JSON tools that you can test posts and puts and deletes. We're going to go ahead and use a tool called Postman. I'll provide a link in the description box so you guys can check out Postman and use that. And what we want to do is utilize another function on the repo. So now we're calling the save method on the repo and then we're going to pass in that new user and save it to the database. The JPA repo handles all of this and will actually save it to the database without us having to type any other things. After we do that, let's just go ahead and say something like save. Awesome. So once you have Postman downloaded, go ahead and open that. Okay, so now that we have Postman me and open click new in the top left corner click request and let's name this api get then click save now let's test our existing get endpoint to get a list of users now click send and as you see we get our empty list in the response body great this is exactly what we wanted now let's go ahead and test our new save endpoint create a new request and let's name this api post click save now let's change this to a post and for the url enter our new endpoint we created now select body then go to raw then change this from text to json now let's create our user object okay so now we have our user object 
object. We're going to save John Doe to the database. He has an age of 25 and he's a developer, of course. Okay, now let's go ahead and send this request to the server and see what happens. As you see, we get saved. We get saved because this is exactly what we put as the return in our controller. Now let's go back to Postman. Let's do the request to get a list of our users again to see if that did indeed save. So now we're back at our get request. Now let's send this again. And as you see in the output, we indeed get our John Doe user that we just saved. Awesome. Now we see that we are actually persisting data in our app. Now let's check the database to see if it's saved there as well. Open up MySQL Workbench. Now let's do a select from the table and see what happens. As you see, we do get the John Doe user in here. Okay, so now let's move on to the update functionality of our API. Okay, so we're in our controllers class. What you want to do is create a new method. We're going to call it update user. Then we're going to annotate it with request body. Now let's annotate this method with with put mapping. Let's give it a value of update, then a forward slash with the user ID. So now since we're passing in the ID and the URL, we need to also take in that parameter in the function. Okay, so now we're taking in an ID of long to the function. Now we need to annotate that ID with the annotation of path variable. Now within our method body, let's actually find that user. We can find the user by using another function on the user repo. Okay, so we're going to call this find by ID method on the user repo and pass in the ID that was in the path. Then we're going to call this get function on that to actually get the user. Now let's set the user attributes from the parameter to the updated user we just created. Now let's call that save method on the user repo again to save this user. Now let's just return something that says something like update it. Now let's rerun our app. Okay, so there were no issues. Now let's go ahead and go back to Postman and create a new request. Click new. Let's name this request API put. Now let's change it from get to put and put in our newly created endpoint. Okay, so now in the URL, we're putting a localhost 8080 forward slash update forward slash one. We're putting one because the user that's currently in the database has an ID of one. The ID we put in the URL will be the user that gets updated. Okay, so now let's select body, go to raw, then change it from text to JSON. Okay, now let's go ahead and copy our user from our post request. Let's paste that in the put request and let's change something. Let's change him from developer to a senior developer. Now let's send this. As you see, we get updated. Now let's call our get request again and see if it actually updates John Doe. Awesome. So now John Doe is a senior developer. So now we currently have a get request, a post request and a put request all working. So now we have the C working in CRUD, the R working in CRUD, the U working in CRUD. And now we just have to work on D finally. So let's go back to IntelliJ. Okay. Now let's create a new function and let's call it something like delete user. Okay. So this function will take in another long path variable of ID. We're going to annotate this class with delete mapping and let's give it a value of forward slash delete, then the ID. Okay, so now let's call that find by ID method on the user repo to get the user. Now let's call the delete method on that user repo. Okay, so we're calling the delete method on the user repo and we're passing in the user that we want to delete. Now let's go ahead and return something like delete user with ID, then the ID. Now let's rerun the app. Okay, so now let's go back to Postman and create a new request. Go to new in the top left. Let's call it API delete. Now let's change this from a get to a delete and pass in your newly created endpoint. Okay, so we're passing in localhost 8080 forward slash delete delete forward slash the ID we want to delete. Okay, so let's go ahead and send this and see if it works. Okay, now we get deleted user with the ID one. Let's go back to our get request and see if it actually deleted. Awesome. So we no longer have any users in the database. So our delete functionality is indeed working. So awesome guys, we have a get working, a post working, a put working and a delete. So congrats guys, you guys have really created your first fully functioning CRUD RESTful API. Awesome guys, congrats. I hope you guys enjoyed this video and remember subscribe to the channel guys. It helps me out a lot and remember to like the video. Alrighty, have a good one guys. Have a great rest of your day. I'm out of here. See you in the next video. Peace.